Welcome everyone uh, for the new season of the Restoration Seminar. And uh, I actually am really glad that uh, Daniel Hogan could be our first speaker. We met with Daniel on several occasions, actually at his uh, radio show that he's doing, Superfund 101. And uh, I think this is a great service for, for everybody that he's doing and informs us of all kinds of uh, things that are ongoing related to the super fund issues and he is really great in asking questions from us so he interviewed me and I was many times oh well I never even thought that about, <laughs> you know in, in that context so uh, it's really it's really uh, great to talk to him about issues and, and he sees really nice uh, relationships and interactions that you know some of the specialists like myself you know I'm doing one kind of thing but he's seen over, he's overseen a lot of different uh, um, projects and issues that are ongoing uh, on our super fun side. So I'm, I'm really glad you actually took our uh, invitation. And before Daniel starts his presentation, I would like to uh, introduce him shortly. Daniel Hogan has been working in a non-profit community radio for three years now as both a DJ and a Jordan journalist. In July of 2017, himself and the general manager of KBMF created their first news hour made of entirely local content. Stories since then have covered a range of topics including history preservation, parking garages, environmental cleanup, and oral histories. He hosts, he hosts a weekly talk show called Superfund 101 where he has a 20 to 30 minute conversation with experts, activists, scientists, and government officials about remedy and restoration of land and people in the country's largest Superfund site. And this is shortly about him. He might want to talk more about what he's doing and how he's doing it. And uh, I would like to welcome you. Thanks for. Thank you so much, Robert. I definitely will talk more about myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I am not uh, an expert. I talk to experts and I've record their what they say and broadcast it um, so basically I grew up in Butte but didn't know anything about the Berkeley pit or Superfund or contamination or lead levels or anything like that um, and then when I moved back here uh, well maybe I should start so I work for KVMF the community radio station here in Pound is a uh, low power we only have a hundred watt tower uh, we broadcast online globally but it's an all-volunteer run, mostly volunteer run radio station. I'm one of the three employees, um, and it's funded solely by the public. And we get some money from grants, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit because of how it relates to Superfund, but uh, everything we do is only possible because we receive donations, and people believe in us, and people want us to do it. Uh, it's a community radio station licensed to a nonprofit. The nonprofit is the Butte America Foundation, and the mission of that foundation is to educate the public and uphold the tenets of social justice through radio. And social justice is a loaded term, but we believe it as uh, performing our duty as members of society in order to educate people and get the truth out there. So we have that duty. We don't always have the resources. Uh, one of the resources we do have is, um, like I said, donations. I was in AmeriCorps VISTA for a year last year and through that program was federally funded they basically pay half my wages we decided on all these programs we wanted to start and one of the ones I insisted on was some sort of super fund programming so we are um, very religiously avowed to doing everything locally we want local content produced for local people even though we broadcast on a worldwide scale so when I decided that I wanted to do the super fund programming um, I still had, not, I had no idea really what it was. I knew that the Berkeley Pit was a big toxic uh, amount of water. I knew there's still mining going on. I knew that there was stuff that had been done from here all the way to Missoula. Uh, so when I was talking to people at the radio station about it, a lot of the people who I always thought of and still think of as really well educated and very smart and very on top of things would often ask me, what is Superfund? And I begin to have apprehensions, you know, how can I report on something that I don't even know to understand? And when I was asked that 
question, what is Superfund, the first thing that came to my head was, you know, well, shit, I don't, I don't know what it is either. <laughs> I better find out how to answer that question. <laughs> so that was kind of the, I just decided to dive in and immediately started interviewing people, uh, having conversations with people. I wouldn't even, not even really an interview, it's just what they want to talk about. Um, and it's still a hard question to answer, but a gentleman f uh, in town, Evan Barrett, who is very involved with the Restore Our Creek Coalition and many other things, is a uh, huge resource on history, gave me this really interesting story about the origins of Superfund that I'll kind of share with you. Uh, this is a very crude timeline, um, is within timeline upon timeline of a lot bigger things. But long story short, uh, 1977, Atlantic Richfield Company, the oil company, purchases the Anaconda Company, which had been the, you know, the company here in Butte Mining for almost a century before that. And even before the Anaconda Company, people were digging holes in the ground and rerouting waterways uh, starting in the late 1860s. In the 70s, the oil companies were replete with enormous amounts of money because of the uh, Arab oil embargo. A barrel of oil went from $3 to $30. and a lot of them said, well, what else can we do? Uh, extraction is our business. What else can we extract from the earth? Mining sounds easy. Let's do that. Let's buy some mining companies. Didn't work out at all. Uh, the return in, on oil is much quicker than the return on mining. It's like between th uh, you know, oil, you get your money back in three years, ten, 10 years for hard rock mining. So September 29th of 1980, uh, ARCO flies two jets to Helena and Washington DC to talk with state representatives from Montana and the governor, all the top brass at, in Helena as well as uh, the mayor of Butte, basically says, we'll see you later. Uh, we're not making you money. Uh, if you can't find anyone who wants to buy this, we're gonna tear everything down and leave. They basically offered the state $5 million for economic development money. Uh, shortly after that, November 4th, there's an election in the United States, Ronald Reagan gets elected, the House and the Senate flip nationally from Democratic control to Republican control. And uh, what is called a lame duck session ensues after that, which basically means everything is flipped. Congress doesn't really get anything done because everyone's waiting for the new, the changing of the guard kind of. In this period, uh, the democratically controlled Senate had this super fun bill kind of floating around and decided against all odds to pass it. And on December 11th, 1980, just over a month later, uh, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act is signed into law, and that is Superfund, or CERCLA is what it's called. And within that law, it contains retroactive um, compensation. So ARCO bought the Anaconda Company, they bought the cleanup. Uh, Within about a month, Butte went from getting maybe some of the $5 million pie that ARCO offered the state of Montana to having now to pay many, many multiples of that. Um, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and they probably had no idea that their relationship with Butte would last this long. So, but they still didn't want to mine here. So between 1980 and 1983, the smelter closes in Anaconda, the refinery closes in Great Falls, 5,000 paychecks are gone in Butte uh, from the mine. And on uh, Earth Day, 1983, the water pumps in the Kelly mine that kept water out of all the workings underneath us and in the Berkeley pit are shut off. It begins to fill with water and there's no turning back. Um, and from 1983 to 1987, this entire complex of Superfund sites is formed. Um, th within the Butte area is what they call it. There's 13 operable units right now. So everything is divided up into uh, what specific needs. There's the pole plant, the Butte Priority Soils operable unit, um, the Butte Mine Flooding operable unit, which is the Berkeley Pit. These all have very specific problems and have to be looked at from very specific ways. <coughs> um, all, all these pictures in the back, by the way, I stole from a friend of mine who uh, takes really great pictures. This is in Lower Butte Area 1. Uh, probably probably in the north side tailings actually. Um, but so finding out, you know, kind of the origins of Superfund and knowing that for 30 years people have been fighting to get things cleaned up or to get payouts or to get out of Dodge, I really wanted to focus on what was going on now. There's a lot of kind of retroactive 
complaining and uh, it should have been done this way, should have been done that way, and uh, a lot of it, you know, it should have been done differently maybe, but there's nothing you can do about that now. So I wanted to find people that were working on it now, people that were studying it, and uh, get their sense and their perspective of everything. Because the, the decision maker, makers and the experts that inform those decision makers all have personalities and those personalities affect outcomes. So I wanted to move beyond the echo chamber in Butte. There's a lot of yelling that goes on. There's, uh, you know, the Superfund meetings are not fun. They get very contentious. There's a lot of opposing views. There's a lot of people that won't let go of what happened in the past uh, and look to the future. And I wanted to get these opposing groups not, I wanted to get them together eventually. But I, I also wanted, you know, I wanted the series of Superfund 101 to seem like they were all together talking to each other. And, you know, like I said earlier, their personalities need to come out because that's what really tells people what's going on. Um, the two R words, there's many R words actually, but these are the big two, remediation and restoration. A lot of people throw those around kind of willy-nilly. Um, there's a, an order of operations to it. Remediation happens and then restoration happens. But the definition of those, you know, is, is taking a little bit of contamination off of a site, putting 18 inches of topsoil and planting grass remediation. Um, can restoration ever really occur? Because we don't know what this place looked like before, so we can't restore it to that. Does restoration just mean uh, making something new and healthy, or does it mean bringing it back to what it was? And then, uh, most of all, I wanted this to be really approachable for anyone and everyone who's listening, and so I needed to limit the technical jargon. There's this enormous alphabet soup of, uh, you know, CERCLA and RICRA and CTEC and CFWEP, and, you know, people, people throw those around a lot, and they need to because there's, they're experts and they're trying to get things done. But I decided that on my show that that wasn't going to happen, and people need to explain every um, technical term that they use. Uh, this, I hope you can all see it well, is a piece of art that I wanted to basically emulate in the form of broadcast. This is a project done by um, Mr. Dave Hutchins, who was a PhD uh, candidate here in the Material Sciences Department. And the title of it is it's Parts Per Million. So in this wooden box is a cubic yard of soil, of tailings, and then all of these vials you see around it are um, the metal content of that thing. So you see right here, there's 48 parts per million of cadmium. That's what that much cadmium looks like. In the back, the largest one is iron, I believe, and you know, lead, copper, arsenic, um, zinc, so on. So this, you know, this is uh, a really stunning, there's another picture over here, representation of you know, what people talk about when they talk about tailings and what it means, what it can do, what it can harm and what needs to be removed, how do you clean it up. Um, you know, it's, it's such an easy way to see how much lead is in a cubic yard of dirt and you know, how hazardous that can be. So the, before I got into this, the, real, the only real conversations I ever had about Superfund were at uh, the Imagine Butte Resource Center, which is a kind of a creative space art gallery here in town, and it's run by a woman, Olivia Everett. Um, and the conversations we always had were how do we let regular people know about this? And art is definitely one way, but I decided that broadcasting would be another way because not everybody listens to the radio, but some people do, and those people have a right to know. So I wanted to, like I said, dive in immediately. Um, I'm gonna go over, I thought some of these people would be in the room today, and so I'm glad they're not because their faces are up on the screen right now, but uh, I wanted to you know, dive in and really explore the personalities of decision makers. So this gentleman up here in the left-hand corner is John Sesso. He's the uh, Superfund director for, the, for Butte Silver Bow. Um, Julia Crane there in the center. Tom Malloy. I couldn't find a picture of Eric Hassler, but this is uh, kind of a picture representing the residential metals abatement program. So this is what the city has its own Superfund department that constantly has to maintain um, waterways and these caps that are put on everything, they have to make sure stormwater goes to the right place. Um, it, the residential metals, metals abatement program is if you have a house and 
your yard or your attic is a, a test positive for action levels above a certain point of lead or arsenic, they will come and remove everything for free and give you new insulation, they'll give you a new yard. Um, it's, you know, it's very contentious because the action levels here are the second highest in the country, especially for lead, other than Leadville, Colorado. So you can, you're still allowed to have a yard with a bunch of lead in it. If it's you know, just under that action level, they won't clean it up. But that's something that's been decided on. But these are the people that work in this field every single day doing remedial work and restoration work and ma maintenance. Maintenance is the huge thing. All of the grassy areas on the hill right now are what are called caps. It's basically um, a permeable layer. Sometimes there's lime in there to kind of neutralize acidic rock and uh, 18 inches of topsoil and then some sort of vegetation. In the beginning it was a lot of crested wheatgrass. Um, now it's changing more and more because of the work being done here at Montana Tech actually. Another camp in the Superfund um, campground is the Restore Our Creek Coalition. This is a group of citizens that were concerned and felt that the cleanup wasn't happening to the benefit of the community. And um, you know, they, I, I would say that they're kind of the forefathers of my thought process where let's bring together a lot of different groups and say we want this one thing done and that is a restored Silver Bow Creek through the center of town. It should be beautiful, it should be running water, uh, and it should be accessible to everyone. They fight tooth and nail for what they want. There is a lawsuit saying that Silver Bow Creek, uh, for a long time it was called Metro Storm Drain, MSD, the MSD channel. Uh, There's a lawsuit saying that it was legally a waterway of Montana and in the Montana Constitution there is a clause that says waterways in Montana are, must be protected and are uh, supposed to be clean. So Silver Bow Creek is now a waterway of Montana, must be cleaned up. They, um, they really, are they are really good at community organizing. They recently signed, had a petition with 10% of the population signing that petition saying we want a restored creek and you know uh, a lot of people think that the organizations, the city, the EPA, they don't listen but they definitely listen to this one and I'll get back to kind of the relationship between this group and the city in just a moment. Uh, these, this is the camp that I like to hang out with. Uh, this, that's Joe Griffin up in the corner. He's a, a really amazing resource, retired from the DEQ as a project manager. Robert Powell, of course, and Pat Kinneen. These are the experts that I talk about. These are the people that uh, do this for a living or, you know, I think in a lot of cases for fun. They, they love the data, they love the science, they love to problem solve, and they want to inform the decision makers. They have really amazing stories. Uh, I'll relay a couple with you. Pat Kinneen, is kind of the spearhead on the Parrot Tailings Removal Project going on behind the Civic Center. And in 2015, the governor of Montana, Steve Bullock, came to Butte. Uh, Pat was giving him a little tour of that area, saying we really need this to be removed. This has to go away. If Arco didn't want to remove it, they wanted to just cap it and leave it there. But it's really, it was really affecting the groundwater, and they have all these wells that show that. And you can pump groundwater that's bright blue. It looks like blue Gatorade. So he you know, showed that to the governor. I was like, oh my god, wow. And I think they went and walked around a little longer, and he had these two uh, steel or iron, they were iron bottle openers from the Butte Brewing Company, old ones, and he let them sit in the bucket of water for a while while they walked around, came back, pulled them out, they're plated, you know, pure copper, because there's so much copper in this water. Gave one to Steve Bullock, says, we need this cleaned up, here's a gift for you, and here we are now, it's all being dug up. Uh, Joe Griffin taught me about stormwater. The, he was one of the first ones I had, and like I said, I knew nothing when I started. So he was kind of going on and on and on about stormwater, and by the end, I think I had this incredibly blank look on my face, and I had to have him back to re-explain everything. But uh, another important thing he taught me was about uh, what's called TI, or technical and practicability, which is a, a, a good example is the Berkeley pit. So the Berkeley pit, according to the litigation, which Superfund is a, a litigation process, is technically impracticable to clean up. It, has, it can be maintained, but it can't be solved. Um, I think another 
uh, way to say TI is FU, which is financially unwilling. Because, uh, you know, nothing is, they go, there's, there's a reason they don't say technically impossible. It's because it's just financially impractical. There's not enough money to clean up the Berkeley pit. A new TI waiver will be decided on with the Silver Bow Creek Corridor and stormwater. If we can't get stormwater to maintain a level of copper, hey, there's Joe. <laughs> if we can't get stormwater to uh, keep the copper levels down in the creek, there will probably be a TI waiver where the state of Montana has much stricter standards than the federal standards, so they will waive the state standards and will be only be held to the federal standards for the amount of contamination that can go down a waterway. Um, the main goal, like I said, it was AmeriCorps VISTA, so the, I had to have some sort of goal. AmeriCorps is all about goals and projects and showing off. The main goal of Superfund 101 was to lead up to this forum, and we had it here at Montana Tech. Uh, I got all these different folks in the room. I'll kind of go down in the line and say who they are. Starting on the left is Mary Kay Craig, uh, who has been an environmental activist in, here in Butte, working for Citizens with Labor and Environmental Justice and the Restore Creek Coalition for a long, long time. Um, has done a lot of activism, has been fighting for a long time. Next to her is David Hutchins, the PhD candidate here at Tech who made that parts per million uh, piece of art. Next to him is Eric Hassler. He's the Superfund's, Superfund Operation and Management uh, head. He oversees the Residential Metals Abatement Program, the, uh, the CAPS, the, it's called the Breeze, the Butte, uh, Butte Reclamation. I can't remember the rest of it. Uh, the Butte Reclamation Evaluation System. So all the grassy hills all around Butte, they have to go around and monitor for erosion uh, to see if stormwater is coming off of them, if it's going the right place. And um, also the stormwater systems itself. Next to him is Raylan Brandle, who works with the Clark Fork Watershed Education Program. That's here on campus. Highly recommend uh, going to see them about anything that you have to do with reclamation. She does incredibly important work because she's educating children about the Superfund process and uh, kind of where we've been and where we've come, how to make these areas whole again. Pat Kinney next to her and Robert Powell finally on the end there. So we had this forum, uh, like I said earlier, Superfund meetings are not a good time. I don't know if this one was a good time, but it wasn't, no one was yelling at each other. That was the, that was the goal of the, the project was to have people be civil and sane and, uh, you know, David Hutchins and Eric Hassler, I think are, you know, they get along, but they've been in some contentious arguments over the uh, allowable lead levels in yards and um, how it's affecting people. A lot of people think that information is being suppressed. A lot of people think that people are too rambunctious about it all. Uh, so, like I said, we're going to get back, I wanted to get back to the city and the Restore Creek Coalition. I like to call them crickers and ponders. So the crickers want a crick, a, a creek, running from here to here. Uh, and the ponders face, you know, say that we need these stormwater basins. They, these are basins that will catch stormwater from the hill. Uh, let's let's sit, let it sit there for a while. All the particulate matter, most of the particulate matter drops out and then the water can flow down Silver Bow Creek into the Clark Fork, into the Columbia, and into the ocean uh, with less copper in it. Uh, these are the two camps that I, I would say disagree the most. And they disagree because this area here that the crickers think should have a creek won't have one because you know there's there's no water up here except for the Berkeley pit and there's a lot of good solutions about you know the Berkeley pit water is going to be pumped and treated and discharged somewhere why not discharge it up there there was a an idea for a long time to pump in water from Silver Lake over by Georgetown and use that water for a free-flowing creek but the point of agreement or the you know the convergence of these ideas is you know all of this right now is tailings it's incredibly toxic there's blue water um, nothing well things grow there but it's it's more like a laboratory setting than a park I would say 
And without Restore Creek, it probably would have been, some of it would have been removed. Uh, there would have been stormwater features, but it could very well have been uh, asphalt and barbed wire everywhere. So I think that the Restore Creek Coalition feels they're being slighted because there's no creek there right now. But without the way, how hard they fought and the signatures they got and the ideas that they had, none of this green would be here, in my opinion. Um, it's my favorite way to put this, so this is, you know, this is the plan going ahead. It's not for sure. There could be some uh, executive order that nixes the whole thing. We don't know yet. But my favorite way to describe it is elegant. You know, all the water comes off the hill. It's, it's going to be contaminated unless, you know, billions of dollars of work is done. And um, with this system, it sits there long enough and is uh, presented in such a way that it can go down the stream clean again. Um, so I, these are some questions that I have, uh, this is kind of for the restoration students, I don't want you to, if you can answer them, I would love to hear the answers, but going forward with the series, I, you know, I think about these things all the time, and these are questions that are on my mind a lot uh, that I thought I might pose to you, and um, you know, maybe it's something that you could think about in the future. For instance, so how do plants and fungi suitable to this climate accumulate contaminants of concern? Um, one of Robert's students, Jared Trilling, did this really excellent project last year about the, um, the way plants prefer areas with different amounts of contamination in them. But if those plants then uptake copper or lead or zinc or mercury or arsenic, uh, what does that mean for restoration? Does that mean we can remove that plant and put it somewhere else and then that's taking arsenic out of the ground? Because that would be incredibly important. Um, you know, looking at how we weigh functionality versus aesthetics. A lot of what I think Silver Bow Creek fought for is aesthetics. And aesthetics are incredibly important. It has to be a nice place to be. It has to be beautiful. And I think um, you know, natural is beautiful. Restoration is beautiful. Elegant systems are beautiful. But how do you weigh that against functionality? What does it, can it be both all the time? Or do you have to sacrifice one for the other every once in a while? Um, Will restoring a landscape erase the lessons of the past? In 2024, if all this work goes through and we're free and clear and we're delisted for, as a Superfund site, will people forget how we got to be a Superfund site? Can we teach other communities lessons on how to mine responsibly or restore responsibly? There's a lot of work that was done on the Hill in the 90s that needs to be redone now because it was done wrong. Uh, what happens to the Berkeley Continental Yankee Doodle, Yankee Doodle ecosystem? So this is what basically what I'm talking about is the Montana Resources property right now. When the ore body runs out, which uh, um, people from Montana Resources have told me, they're projected to, it's projected to last 35 years. Um, it, whether that's inflated or not, it will run out one day. What happens to that site? Does it? Is that a super fun site? There's obviously much more regulation in place now, but is there the right amount? Um, you know, Berkeley pit water will be needed to treat, will be needed uh, to be treated in perpetuity. That means forever. Humans aren't forever. Humans don't last forever. The Berkeley pit will be here uh, forever on a human scale, not forever on a ge geologic scale. Eventually, something will happen. What other points of concern are there within that system. And um, it's kind of speaking to that, what systems can we put in place now to benefit ecosystems downstream? I really think that the stormwater ponds within the Silver Bow Creek Corridor are beneficial and will um, beneficially affect people, people and wildlife and aquatic life downstream. What else can we do now that makes us as the headwaters of the Columbia River uh, you know, the best starting point possible for a drop of rainwater. It's just some things to think about. Um, and with that, if there's any questions or comments or answers. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>